I know you've been doing some work on quantum communication and then gravity is quantum error correcting code. And I'm just wondering what those two pieces of work are about. Well, you know, over the years, so right now I talked about something that happened like 25 years ago, right? Uh, believe it or not, but more things have happened in the past 25 years. A lot of things have happened and a lot of them uh, were of course done by, by people younger than me. Um, the, and, 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 and they were helped greatly by having the ADS-CFT correspondence as a concrete setting where you can study a specific theory that actually is the quantum gravity theory and, and check that the ideas you have about how information and space-time work against what you know about that theory. Uh, so you can have a lot more confidence uh, that your ideas are right, e even if those ideas are perhaps more complex and more refined and a little bit otherwise would be harder to check. So one of the key things that we have learned, which I think we now understand fits into this actually very general scheme that, that applies to all spacetimes, not just ADS, but which was first understood by studying ADS, um, is this idea that the way that a gravitating spacetime encodes our local information into, into a quantum state uh, is uh, an example of something called a quantum error correcting code something that people began studying uh, also many years ago, um, which the significance of which I did not appreciate at the time. I thought it was maybe a bit of an engineering problem. When you build a quantum computer, those things are not perfect. They lose information sometimes, and you want, you want to build in a kind of redundancy that, that uh, protects against the loss of information uh, to an environment that degrades your, your quantum information inside the quantum computer. Uh, you can't do that in the same way as you do it with classical information by just duplicating it because quantum information cannot be cloned. Uh, but there are other ways of doing it that are more uh, subtle and, and sophisticated. That, uh, Ironically, John Prescott, who I mentioned earlier in the context of the holographic principle, was also a pioneer in that field. Um, well, in the 2010s, I believe, uh, Daniel Harlow... Uh, let's see, I think uh, Al Mary, uh, who I also mentioned before, and uh, I think Erin Wall played a role in this, uh, Shidol, um, and others understood that in ADS-CFT, the way that, that the quantum information is encoded, that is precisely a quantum error correcting code. That, that means that I can give you different parts of the boundary of the space-time, uh, and if, you, if I give you two-thirds of the boundary, it doesn't matter which two-thirds I give you, you can reconstruct what's in the center of the space-time. Um, but if I give you only one-third, you have absolutely no idea. This is, this is the kind of thing that happens in quantum error correcting codes. Um, and uh, over time, uh, that relation was further refined. Um, my colleague here, Jeff Pennington, and my former student, Chris Akers, um, pointed out that the way the information is encoded on the boundary um, is through... Um, so in order for the information to end up on the boundary, uh, you have to sort of... It's as if gravity was solving a particular co quantum communication problem where I'm trying to send you a message. Um, I have certain resources available. The resources turn out to be proportional to the areas of space-time. Um, and I can successfully send you the message if the message isn't too long. So I, I, there's, you know, I basically burn up these resources by sending you the message. So if I try to send you too much, I just don't have enough resources for that. Um, the kind of problems that people usually like to consider because we're lazy are so-called asymptotic problems, where I make the problem a little bit simpler by imagining that there's like infinitely many of you and me, uh, and each one is trying to send that message to the other, uh, but we get to take advantage of certain ways of, of sort of compactifying. Uh, it's like creating a zip file or something on your computer. Uh, you, can, you can get rid of some redundancies and, and save resources by doing so. Uh, and, and the amount of resources that you then need is measured by something called the von Neumann entropy uh, of, the, uh, of the message that you're trying to send. Um, well, in the real world, it's, it's rarely the case that there's many, uh, infinitely many copies of you and me. Uh, and so we must solve what might be called a single-shot quantum communication problem. 
where I don't get to take advantage of this extra redundancy that, and, and being able to compactify and so on. Um, and in that case, the amount of resources that I need to send you the same message uh, is in general higher. And it's, it's measured by something called the, the smooth max entropy that, in fact, to my knowledge, was only introduced into quantum information theory by Renner and others in, in, the, in the knots uh, of, this, of this millennium. Uh, and what, what uh, my student Chris Akers and, and my colleague Jeff Pennington realized is that that actually governs what region you can reconstruct from the boundary of ADS. So it's, the areas have to, be a re, have to be viewed as a resource not for, you know, weighed against the von Neumann entropy of, of the quantum information in the matter that's in the, in the universe, but, but this weird new thing called, the, I mean, to me new, uh, called the, the, the smooth max conditional entropy. So those are the things that enter. Okay, so this was to me a, another revelation that increasingly sophisticated concepts from quantum information theory enter into how space and time actually emerge. And it's, it's things that I would have, I'm going to be honest here that I would have dismissed as overly related to practical engineering problems. You know, I, I know I was like, why is John Preskill working on quantum error correction? Like, who cares about errors? You know, those are practical issues. Uh, what, what a loss to our field, you know, and now he's not working on black holes anymore. I'm so sad. Well, he was way ahead of the rest of, of us. Um, and, and, and then single shot versus asymptotic quantum communication problems. You know, one is the sort of idealized thing that you might think will enter into a quantum theory of gravity. The other might strike you as, you know, a practical problem unlikely to show up in a fundamental theory of physics. Well, gravity thinks like an engineer. It's, it's, it's a wonderful, uh, I think it's a wonderful story uh, that we've been taught again and again that these sort of very applied real life almost concepts from quantum information theory are the ones that matter the most in our growing understanding of how space and time emerge. Um, and so that's been, uh, yeah, that's been a wonderful thing to be part of. Uh, another, by the way, just to squeeze that in, is that gravity is so powerful and its sort of hidden knowledge about quantum mechanics is so powerful that we've discovered new things about theories that have nothing to do with gravity, naively, about quantum field theory, like the standard model of particle physics. We have, for the first time, a, um, a lower bound on the energy density of matter. Energy density of matter can be negative. Uh, so zero is not a lower bound on it. it. Like, you can have some negative amount of energy in, in a small region of space. That's totally okay, as long as there's positive energy elsewhere. Um, but we never had an actual expression for how low it can go. Um, we discovered such an expression by thinking about how gravity organizes uh, quantum information. It's very easy to derive from a fairly simple conjecture about how that should work. Um, and we got this, this very nice expression that has no gravitational constants in it. So it looks like it's a purely a quantum field theory statement. And then people went and like wrote down 100-page proofs in quantum field theory you know, using all of the, uh, you know, powerful methods of algebraic quantum field theory that I didn't even know about to show that this is really true. But I think it's extremely remarkable that gravity knows so much about quantum mechanics that we can effectively use it as a discovery tool uh, about a, a theory in which, naively, we have far better control over, we completely understand it, so we still discover something new about it. 